بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء وسيد المرسلين وحبيب إله العالمين أب القاسم محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المكرمين الغرر الميامين سيما بقية الله في الأراضين وحجته على الخلائق أجمعين سيدنا وإمام زماننا وصاحب نعمتنا وولي أمرنا مهدي هذه الأمة وطاووس أهل الجنة الحجة بن الحسن العسكري فداه وارواح العالمين اللهم كل وليك الحجة ابن الحسن صلواتك عليه وعلى آبائه في هذه الساعة وفي كل ساعة وليا وحافظا وقائدا وناصرا ودليلا وعينا حتى تسكنه أرضك طوعا وتمتعه فيها طويلا Brothers and sisters السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته We said in the previous lecture that our relationship with the Ahlul Bayt, with God's prophets, messengers, apostles, and vicegerents, his representatives in our world, has to be a multi-dimensional relationship. We cannot confine our connection to God's vicegerents only to sentimental or emotional attractions. Loving them is the first step we take towards a fellowship with them. Putting their names up on the wall, selecting their names for our children, Reciting or listening to poetry about them are all great things. In fact, traditions tell us that selecting the names of the Ahlul Bayt for our children is a form or an expression of love towards the Ahlul Bayt. The Imam then states, Alaysa deenu illa al hub is religion anything but love? which is one of the attributes and representations and characterizations of the religion of Islam that no other religion has. Is religion anything but love? This is the statement of Imam Zain al-Abideen. And so, all of these expressions, all of these manifestations are incredibly important. But that's not enough. Because that is only the first step towards creating a relationship with the Imams, a relationship with God's representatives. So we spoke last night in the multidimensional nature of this relationship. And we said that one of the manifestations of our love and devotion to God's vicegerents is that we connect with them on an intellectual level, on a visceral level. In other words, we learn their teachings. Our eighth Imam famously declares, Rahimallahu abdan ahya amrana. May Allah bless and bestow His mercy upon a slave who revives our cause. When asked what that means, the Imam elaborates. He said, To revive the cause of the Ahlul Bayt isn't just about gatherings, celebrating their festivities and mourning their tragedies, but also to acquire their knowledge and to then teach it to other people. This is an essential component of the resilience and the progress 
of the community of the followers of the Ahlul Bayt. Over the last 14 centuries, the Ahlul Bayt had followers who carried this mantle with them across the lands. They acquired the knowledge of the Ahlul Bayt. They learned what the Imams had to offer. Then they taught it to other people. They passed down this knowledge from generation to generation. That is what has preserved our identity. And so I mentioned Nahjul Balagha as an example of a book that is deserted. And it's with the utmost sadness that as followers of Ali ibn Abi Talib, as people who proclaim truly that we are devoted to him and that he is the most beloved person after the Holy Prophet to our hearts, and yet his most famous work, although it was not written by Amir al-Mu'mineen, but it's a compilation of the sermons, letters, and short maxims of wisdom by Amir al-Mu'mineen. And yet the Shia have deserted this book. I mentioned Professor Gary Legenhausen, who read only the first sermon of Nahj al and converted to Islam. He says that when I read that, I became absolutely mesmerized. One sermon of Nahj al can transform a previously Catholic professor born in New York, taught at various universities, and turned him into a devoted follower of Ali ibn Abi Talib. So why is this text, why is this book alien to us? Tonight what I'd like to do is to read you a passage from Nahj al in which Amir al muminin addresses one of his companions. A man by the name of Harith al-Hamdani, who was originally from Yemen, but was an incredibly loyal companion to Amir al muminin And the Imam has had many interactions with him, truly inspirational and beautiful. One of them is this letter. The letter is actually letter 96. So as I said, Nahj al is comprised of three sections. You have the sermons, you have the letters, and you have the maxims, the short words of wisdom. In the letters section, I'm giving you the address so that you could go back and refer to it, inshallah. It is letter number 96 in Nahj al Listen to what the Imam says. His teachings to Harith al-Hamdani, his advice to this loyal companion, and how applicable it is in our own lives. The Imam provides Harith al-Hamdani with 20 statements, each of which can give rise to civilizations, brothers and sisters. I remember once I had a Christian friend, he was a lawyer, and I said to him that your friendship matters to me. He was a wise man, a religious person as well. I said to him, your friendship is valuable. And the reason for that is grounded in a hadith by a man called Ali ibn Abi Talib. Do you know him? He said, I've heard of him. Who hasn't heard of the wise oracle of the East? Hakim al-Sharq. Even though he was Christian, originally from Lebanon. Said, Who hasn't heard of Ali ibn Abi Talib? I said, well, I want to read you a hadith by this man. The Imam says, a thousand friends is too little, and one enemy is one too many. He paused for a while. He said, by God, he is the wise oracle of the East and the West. What a beautiful statement. A thousand friends is too little. One enemy is one too many. So this is Ali ibn Abi Talib. Every statement of his can completely transform your worldview, your outlook on life, inspire you towards positive action. So in this particular letter of the Imam, the Imam elucidates and articulates 20 words of wisdom. I'm going to read as many as I can, not go through the whole letter, but inshallah we can benefit 
from as many as we can read. The Imam says to him, and I quote, he says, Tamasak bihabl al Quran, O Harith, O Shia of the Ahlul Bayt, hold on to the rope of the Quran. The Quran is the backbone of our religion. The Quran is the foundation on which everything else is built. Hold on to the Quran. At times of darkness, confusion, adversity, traditions tell us and our scholars encourages, encourage us to read a little bit of the Quran. It illuminates the heart. Every day, if you can set aside 15, 20 minutes after your prayers, you wish to engage with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Don't leave the prayer mat right after salat is finished. Have you seen when people watch a football game? They're not content with just watching the game. As soon as the whistle is blown, do they leave their seat? Of course not. They have to sit back and discuss it and talk about what their favorite team, the one that, that they support, what they did right, what they did wrong, this goalkeeper, this player, this... The conversation goes on and on and on and on. They do taqibat of their football games. When it comes to our salat, brothers and sisters, taqibat are integral to preserving salat. Traditions tell us that if our salat have any faults in them, which of course they do. This is a prayer performed by Mahdi al-Mudarrisi, not by Ali ibn Abi Talib or his companions. So our prayers often have many flaws where we think of other things. I think of my problem outside, at work, my issues with my spouse. And so a lot of time is spent with us completely ambivalent of the purpose of salah, the way it's performed, the various functions and movements. Traditions tell us that ta'qibat help reinforce your prayers. They patch up and fix those flaws. So ta'qibat are very important. One of the important ta'qibat is to recite a little bit of Quran. Traditions say, for instance, that if you read 10 verses a day, Allah illuminates your heart. At a time when hearts are filled with darkness from all the things that we encounter, all the scenery that come to our eyes and all the conversations that we overhear and all the problems that we have. How do you illuminate the heart that's been darkened by all of these things? Through Quran. So the Imam says, Tamasak bihabl al Quran, wastansahu. Istinsah means for you to seek the counsel of the Quran. In other words, you know how sometimes you wish to go to someone who's wise in your family, in the local community, and ask him for advice? One of the main sources of advice should be the Quran. If you're confused about something, open the Quran and read through it and see if you can derive any lessons from it. If you can acquire any counsel from the Quran, which of course you can. Even when you're reading the Quran on a regular basis, read it as though. The Qur'an is advising you. So the Imam says, وَاسْتَنْصِحُ Not just pick up the Qur'an when it's time to take istikhara, which is the case with many people. The Qur'an is only picked up from the shelf and dusted off when I need an istikhara. I remember a few years ago, I was in a center somewhere, and after we finished the A'mal of Laylatul Qadr, namely, the particular ritual where you place the Qur'an over your head. A friend was sitting next to me. He then lifted the Qur'an, put it on the shelf, and he said, goodbye until next Laylatul Qadr next year. He was joking, of course, but this is the reality. In the holy month of Ramadan, the Qur'an is recited, the Qur'an is sought, but then after, it is completely abandoned. The Imam says, وَاسْتَنْصِحُ Do three things when it comes to the Qur'an. Seek counsel from it. Number one. Number two. حَلَالَهُ وَحَرِّمْ حَرَامًا Read it. And when it comes to the verses where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, because again, the Quran is composed of primarily three sections or three uh, categories of verses. 
One category is mawa'idullah. It's when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala offers guidance and counsel. The other is the ahkam, which is where Allah provides the legal code and the guidelines for what is permissible and what is not. And the third part is the stories of the Quran, stories of previous nations and religious traditions. So the Imam addresses all of these three parts or categories. He says, seek counsel from it, those verses where Allah is offering guidance and advice. Abide by the halal and haram, which is in reference to the verses that have to do with ahkam and rulings. And number three, وَصَدِّقْ بِمَا سَلَفَ مِنَ الْحَقِّ And believe in the truth that was revealed previously, meaning all the stories of the Qur'an and all of the parables. Then the Imam says, وَاعْتَبِرْ بِمَا مَضَى مِنَ الدُّنْيَا لِمَا بَقِيَ مِنْهَا Seek lessons in what has passed from the dunya and use those lessons for what is to come. The Imam then says, فَإِنَّ بَعْضَهَا يُشْبِهُ بَعْضَ Because this world runs through a series of consistent patterns. You'll notice that even though we live in very changing and different times, you can always draw parallels to things that happened before. You can always go back to the stories of the Quran and the stories of the traditions of the Ahlul Bayt and as well as other stories, other things that have occurred in the past, historical events, you can always go back to them and find parallels. Why? Because even though events that transpired in the past might have happened in a different time or era, the nature of humans hasn't changed. Humans are just as greedy today as they were a thousand years ago. They're just as jealous of those who are successful or have better things than they do than they were 10,000 years ago. They have the same tendencies, the same intrinsic uh, leniencies, the same problems that we suffer from today, although they manifest themselves in different ways, but the pattern is still very consistent. Then the Imam says, وَأَكْثَرْ ذِكْرَ الْمَوْتِ Always remember death. Inshallah, we might talk about this in the upcoming nights. But to remember death, brothers and sisters, is one of the most potent and powerful ways of quelling demonic desires. Crushing these tendencies that we have that are animalistic in nature. Be in a constant state of remembrance when it comes to death. Then the Imam says something which might be relevant to. Uh, some of us within the community. He says, وَأَكْثِرْ ذِكْرَ الْمَوْتِ وَمَا بَعْدَ الْمَوْتِ And remember what's going to come after death. وَلَا تَتَمَنَّ الْمَوْتَ إِلَّا بِشَرْطٍ وَثِيقٍ Never wish to die. We have many traditions from the Holy Prophet and the Imams that say it is wrong to wish death upon yourself. Why? Because to wish death upon yourself is a manifestation of objecting to the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A problem happens in my life and suddenly I'm calling out, I wish I were dead. But essentially what you're saying is, I don't want God's will in my life. I don't want what Allah has wanted for me. So it's an objection to the decree of the creator of the universe. And so traditions tell us, never wish to die. This is something you should leave in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whatever he's decreed for you, whether your life is difficult or pleasurable and comfortable, ultimately he chooses when I should die. Illa bi'ahdin wathiq. The only one who can wish to die is the one who has prepared himself fully for the afterlife. And I certainly am not one of them. In other words, when Imam al kadhim alayhi salatu was salam <laughs> while imprisoned in the dungeons of Harun alayhi la'ainullah, the Imam says, Oh Allah, 
O one who saves a child from the womb of his mother, save me from the prison of Harun and wishes to die after years of incarceration, the Imam is different because the Imam has fully prepared himself for what is to come after death. But unless I am like that, I should never wish to die. The Imam also says prior to that, he says, وَعَظِّمِ اسْمِ اللَّهِ أَن, تذكره أن تذكره إلا علاها. He says, glorify the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Don't mention God's name except that, except in that which is the truth. In other words, as they say, don't mention God's name in vain. We have a hadith, brothers and sisters, when it comes to the glorification of the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which are incredible. For example, we have hadiths that say, when you write the name of Allah, do so meticulously and properly. Because you know how sometimes when you're writing quickly, your handwriting is not as perfect as you would when you're writing very slowly. But when it comes to the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, pay close attention to writing it properly. Even the handwritten name of Allah should be glorified. That's why we can't touch it unless we are in a state of wudu and purification. In fact, scholars say that no matter what language it's in, you're not allowed to touch it unless you have wudu. Even if it's in a different language other than Arabic. The name of Allah should be glorified. We have narrations that say that you should always honor the name of Allah and not mention it haphazardly and randomly. For example, the Imam provides an example. He says, when a person has a dog and he says, may Allah bring humiliation to you. He's speaking to the dog or he has a flock of sheep, for example, and he speaks to the animals and mentions God's name. The Imam says, don't do that. If you're going to mention the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it has to be in a context that glorifies and exalts Allah. So the Imam says, don't mention his name unless it is in the context of the truth. Then he says, Wahda. The Imam gives us a few warnings and begins by saying, be warned of doing these things. What are they? Number one, he says, Wahdar kull amalin yardahu sahibuhu li nafsihi wa yakrahuhu li ammatin nas. Beware of carrying out an action that if you saw other people doing it, you would be displeased. You don't like other people driving in a certain way, for instance. Well, don't do it yourself. In other words, the Imam is giving us a benchmark. He's giving us a litmus test. Even if you go beyond the teachings of divine scriptures, there are things that as a human you can recognize and understand. If you don't like people parking in a disabled spot, for instance, or driving in a way that's hazardous or dangerous, well, don't do it yourself. He's okay doing it himself, but he doesn't want other people doing it. He said, be warned, don't do this. Number two. Beware of doing something that if you were in public, you wouldn't do it. So don't do it in private either. A lot of the things that we do, if we were being observed by others around us, we wouldn't do them. So the Imam says, be warned of doing this in private. Again, a great litmus test, a great benchmark. Number three, moving on because we want to cover quite a bit. He says, wahdar kull amalin. And beware of doing something that if you were asked about it later, you would deny doing it. If you're going to deny it, don't do it. Or the Imam says, you might apologize from people for doing this. If you have to apologize for it or deny it, 
Don't do it. Then the Imam says, وَلَا تَجْعَلْ عِرْضَكَ غَرَضًا لِنِبَالِ الْقَوْلِ Try not to make your reputation, not to put your reputation in harm's way. Don't do something that might be misconstrued or misunderstood. There's a hadith that says once Rasulullah was standing, it was perhaps dark at night, and he was speaking to a woman. A group of companions walked past, past him. The Prophet stopped them. He said, come. They came to the Prophet. They saw the Prophet speaking to this woman. He said to them, come back. They came back. He said, this is my aunt. They said, Ya Rasulullah, you're a Prophet of God, infallible, this, that. We didn't make any assumptions or draw any conclusions. He said, no, you should know that this was my aunt I'm speaking to. Not some stranger, not a random woman. The Prophet's reputation or the reputation of any believer has to be preserved. If you find yourself in circumstances that if observed by other people could be misunderstood and your reputation could be at stake, ensure that you don't go there. Ensure you don't do these things. It's like when someone says, I was at a nightclub the other day and guess who I saw? I saw such and such. And I'm like, why were you in the nightclub to begin with? What were you thinking? You're trying to tarnish the reputation of another person. But in doing so, Allah exposed you as well. So never put your reputation and standing in the community in harm's way. Some people say, I'll do the right thing and I don't care what anybody says. No, you have to care. People's perception of you matters. You have to ensure that your reputation remains intact. As a matter of fact, brothers and sisters, and this might be applicable to some of you, the hadith says that the best money you spend, afwalul mal, is the money that you spend in preserving your reputation. What does that mean? How is this relevant? You know how sometimes members of the community have a conflict or some kind of disagreement. And so, one of them could be a religious person, the other maybe not so much. And so all dirty laundry is put up on display. They might go to court, they might sue each other. And what happens in the process is that the reputation of both individuals is tarnished. If you can pay the individual that you have an issue with and who is taking you to court, if you can pay him off, even if it's an exorbitant amount, do so to protect your reputation. Even if you think you're right and he's wrong and he's trying to take advantage of you and all these things, and I've heard this a million times, fine, do it because your reputation matters. Not just as an individual, but your reputation as a believer, as a mu'min, as a follower of the Ahlul Bayt. If he has any dirt on you or if he has no dirt, but he concocts and fabricates things against you, that will tarnish your reputation. Pay him off. This money that you're paying is worth every penny, as they say. Get rid of the problem. So the Imam says, don't put your reputation in harm's way. And the example he uses is in front of a barrage of arrows. Protect it. Then he says, People talk. Rumors spread like wildfire. The Imam says, don't speak of everything that you hear from other people. Don't be the means of transmission. Remember, we're not talking about ghibah here, right? We're speaking about things that people talk about. Don't be a vehicle and a means of transmission for the things that you hear from others. The Imam then says, فَكَفَى بِذَلِكَ كَذِبًا you are a liar simply for conveying what other people have said. You could say, well, I'm not the source. I'm simply mentioning what other people have told me. The Imam says that makes you a liar as well. Then he says, وَلَا تَرُدَّ عَلَى النَّاسِ كُلَّمَا حَدَّثُوكِ At the same time, while you shouldn't be a transmitter of rumors and 
conversations that happen in the background, don't reject and deny everything that you hear them say. Why? Because in doing so, you would become ignorant. You're a jahil. In other words, let's say you hear a rumor about someone. Then you want to employ that person in your office, in your restaurant, at your place of work. But you've heard some rumors about them. Don't convey the rumors to others. Don't accuse that person of being immoral and terrible. At the same time, don't deny all of these things. If you go ahead and employ that person and he turns out to be a thief just like you've heard, well, you were an ignorant, you were a jahil person. You have to balance these two things out. Be careful what you do and who you associate with. The Imam then says, وَكْظِمْ الْغَيْظِ وَتَجَاوَزْ عند المقدرة وَحْلُمْ عند الغضب وَصْفَحْ مَعَ الدَّوْلَ تَكُلْ لَكَ الْعَافِيَ He says you want to be well, to have عافية. عافية is to be well, both physically and spiritually. You want to be comfortable in this life? Do this. The Imam provides different layers to the very same concept. He says, When you get angry, crush your anger. Suppress your anger. Anger, brothers and sisters, is what brings destruction to marriages. Anger is what makes partners have a falling out and destroy businesses and livelihood. Anger is what erupts volcanoes of hatred and animosity within a community. Even if someone hurts you or insults you, even if you wish to respond, don't do so when you're angry. Try not to speak when you're angry. Try not to engage with others with anger. Quell the anger, suppress the anger, then figure out how to deal with this situation. وَكْظِمِ الْغَيْظِ Number one. Then the Imam says, وَتَجَاوَزْ عِنْدَ الْمَقْدَرَةِ And forgive when you're able to take revenge. If you're not able to take revenge, then there's no value or merit or virtue in not, in not doing so. When you are able, then that's where you remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A friend, he had a partnership with someone and they had a falling out. They had a fight. There were accusations flying around. You know what it's like. And so they, de they decided to part ways. One of the partners, he maintained the business and the portfolio that he had, and he prospered and he was okay. The other one went bankrupt. The partner who was well off heard that his ex-partner was in trouble financially. This is what it means. That was his moment. That's when he could have gone back to him and say, see what you did to me? See what you said about me? all the accusations, all the lies, and now you have to suffer the consequences. But he didn't do that. He called a mutual friend. He said to him, come, I want you to take this money. Take it to my ex-partner. See if he needs the money. Give it to him as a loan for one year. We have traditions that say giving a loan has more thawab than giving a gift. Because a loan is preserved. It's sustainable. You give it to one person, then he gives it back to you, then you give it to another person. And it helps a multitude of people. So he said, go and give it to him as a loan. But please, I ask you this, don't tell him that it's from me. Because if he finds out it's from me, pride might get in the way. And he might decide not to take it, but I know he needs it. It takes a true man of character to do this. Now that he can take his revenge, he chooses not to. So his friend said to him, why are you doing this? He said, after all, yes, I know we have beef and we've had problems, we've had our issues. But he's a lover of Imam al-Sama. He's a Shia of the other day. I know he has a good heart and I want to help him. 
at his hour of need. So he sent him the money. That mutual friend went and said to him, do you need money? If, there, if you do, I've got some to help you. Get off the ground, get back on your feet. He said to him, I need the money. I'm desperate. I'm bankrupt. I've got debtors and people after me every single day. Of course I need the money. He said, well, here's the money. Take it and you can pay me back in a year's time. So the bankrupt ex-partner said, may Allah bless you. I wish others were like you. I wish my ex-partner was more like you. And he didn't even say a word. The Ahlul Bayt salam, they did exactly this. The Imams would go and help others. They would wear a mask. You've all heard these stories. And then people would backbite them. They would slander them. Like the woman with her two children. I'm sure you've heard the story. Amir al-Mu'mineen saw her in the middle of the marketplace. She was carrying a big basket and was headed home. The Imam noticed that this woman was carrying a big load and wanted to help her out. This was when he was Khalifa. Ali ibn Abi Talib is walking with Qambar, his servant. And the Imam said to him, Qambar, I want to help this woman. Qambar said, I'll carry the basket. He said, no, 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 I want to carry this. On the day of judgment, who's going to carry my load? I want to do this myself. So the Imam went and said to the woman that I'd like to help you. Can I carry the basket? She said, yes, may Allah bless you. I wish Ali ibn Abi Talib knew what I was going through. She didn't recognize the Imam. She said, I wish Ali ibn Abi Talib would come down and see what we go through here. May Allah bless you. The Imam took the basket, didn't say a word. He went all the way to her home. He said, can I help you with anything? She said, yes, I have my children. I want to cook something for them. Maybe you could keep the kids busy while I cook. The Imam said, I'll do that. See, the Imam went to the children and he went on all fours, carried her kids on his back like a horse and walked around the house just like this, keeping the children entertained and happy, putting a smile back on their face, these orphans, while their mother cooked a meal for them. When she came and prepared the food. She noticed how the children were upset before, but now they're laughing. Imagine having Amir al muminin as your playmate. They're laughing, they're happy. She said to him, may Allah bless you, old man. I wish Ali ibn Abi Talib knew what I was going through. I wish he had helped me. The Imam did not say a single word until one of her neighbors came in. She recognized the Imam. She said to her, What's Ali ibn Abi Talib doing in your home, playing with your children, walking on all fours with them? She went to the Imam, she said to him, How ashamed I am of you, O commander of the faithful. The Imam said to her, I am the one who is ashamed of you. Your husband was killed in battle, your children are orphaned, and I didn't come to you earlier. Who does this? Who does it other than Amir al muminin That's why I've always said the Shia of the Ahlul Bayt, they, you'll find them in most countries, they're very difficult to please politically speaking. Why? Because we have a benchmark called Ali ibn Abi Talib. He's the gold standard to us. And so we're not going to be fooled by just about anyone. Yes, we live in peace and we try and, and create communities that are harmonious with those around them, but we're not going to be fooled by anyone. We're not going to idolize anyone because we've got someone like Ali. So the Imam says, when you're in power, that's when you're supposed to forgive and forget. Wahlum and al Again, the Imam says, when you get angry, try and be forbearant. Wasfah ma'ad And when you're in power, asfah. Safh is different from afu. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran says, wa'fu wasfahu. So safh is something that's distinct from afu. What's the difference between them? Afu is when you say to someone, I forgive you. Safh is when you forgive them without even telling them. So it's a step above. Afu and forgiveness. 
Again, brothers and sisters, this sense of forgiveness, this idea that we should suppress our anger has become red mercury in this day and age. It's the mermaid's tears, as they say. It is so rare, so scarce, and that's why we have so many marriages ending up in the gutter. So many divorces take place for the most ridiculous excuses. Sometimes I have to do marriage counseling. It's the one thing that I absolutely dread because it's so painful and difficult. But of course, I know it's also very rewarding. But when I sit down and listen to these couples, the things they tell me are absolutely ridiculous. A little forgiveness, a little forbearance, a little patience, and they could maintain their family, they could raise their children in a good way, but it's become red mercury like I said. It's almost non-existent. Now, I want to mention a couple of stories from the life of Amir al-Mu'mineen once again to put meat on all of this bone. Theory is one thing, practice is another. And there is no greater manifestation of forgiveness than Ali ibn Abi Talib. Really no greater than him, because even, even in the time of Rasulullah, the Prophet did not have to face people like the enemies of Amir al-Mu'mineen. Which is why Rasulullah told him, Ya Ali ibn Abi Talib, there is going to be much hatred and enmity and vitriol that will only surface after I'm dead. And it will be projected in your way. One day, Imam al-Baqir alayhi salatu wasalam says, He says that Amir al-Mu'mineen had a routine. He would pray Salatul Layl at home. Then he would head to the masjid. And in the masjid, the Imam would begin with Nafilatul Subh, which is when he was assassinated. Amir al-Mu'mineen was not killed in Salat al-Fajr, which explains why there weren't people around the Imam. There was no congregation to defend the Imam. He was all alone. And that's because Imam Ali was praying Nafilatul Subh. This was the recommended prayer prior to performing Salatul Fajr. After that, the Imam would pray Salatul Fajr. Then he would stay in his prayer mat until sunrise, doing taqiba. He would do his afkar and a'mal and supplications and prayers. As soon as the sun rose, Amir al muminin would sit on the pulpit. Imam al baqir says the poor people would gather around Amir al muminin Ali ibn Abi Talib is the Imam of those who are poor. They would gather around the Imam, which of course doesn't mean that the rich can't be followers, but the majority of the Shia are like this. So they would gather around the Imam as well as other people, and the Imam would give them a class. He would teach them. The Imam says, Imam al Baqir, he says he would teach them fiqh and Quran. In other words, the rulings of their religion, halal, haram, as well as tafsir and exegesis of the Holy Quran. One day, Imam al-Baqir says that Amir al muminin when he finished all of this, he would then get up and leave the masjid, which would take, let's say, about an hour after sunrise. As soon as the Imam walked out, a person came to him, فَرَمَاهُ بِكَلِمَةٍ بِكَلِمَةِ هُجْرٍ He said something to Amir al muminin which I need to explain a little bit. We have a concept known as la'n. And la'n is when you curse someone. Cursing in the sense that you pray to Allah to cast this person outside the fold of his mercy, to drive him away from his mercy. This is la'n. This is something that's legitimate and acceptable and sanctioned by the Holy Quran. To curse the enemies of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is acceptable. In principle, there are rules, of course, but in principle. Then we have something called sab. And sab is when you give them inappropriate and vulgar titles. It's a profanity. And Shaykh Al Ansari, for instance, in his Makasim, he provides examples for all of these, which is a book that's taught in the Hawza. He says that if you call a Muslim a kafir, 
That's a form of sab. If you call someone a dog, again, that's a form of sab. Then we have something that's called hujr. Hujr is a step above sab. I don't want to give examples, but it has to do with family members. It's the worst and most vulgar profanity. Amirul Mu'mineen. When he was the leader of 50 of today's countries, where Iran was a state in his empire, where Egypt was just a province, when Yemen was just a province, when he was the leader of this entire expansive empire, a man approaches him in broad daylight and in public, and he spits out this vulgar profanity at Amir al Mu'mineen. What does the Imam do? Immediately, Amir al Mu'mineen went back to the masjid. He ascended the pulpit and he responded to the man like so. Listen, the Imam said, There is nothing more beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And neither is it more beneficial than what? It is when you are forbearant. It is when a person who is in a position of authority is patient and forgiving. The Imam then said conversely, And there is nothing more detested by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and more harmful when a leader and a person of authority is both ignorant and lacks patience, lacks forgiveness. Then the Imam looked at the person who had slandered him, who had cursed him. He said to him, should I speak? He said, no, Ya Amir al moment. Forgive me. The Imam said, Qad afawtu wa safa. I've already forgiven you. Imam al-Baqir is then asked by his companions. He's the one who narrates the story. They said to him, what did the Imam mean when he said, should I speak? The Imam said he wanted to mention the family tree of that person. In other words, he's an illegitimate child. He's a khariji. God knows who his father is. God knows who his grandfather is. It's a wishy-washy, disgusting image in his family tree. The Imam said to him, should I speak about your family tree? He said, no, 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 please don't. Because it'll be scandalous. Let people think that my father is so-and-so. The Imam said, I've already forgiven you. This is one example. The other example, Ibn Abi al-Hadid, the famous commentator, Sunni commentator of Nahj al he mentions this story. He says that after the battle of Jamal, and unfortunately, brothers and sisters, we don't talk enough about Jamal, Safin, and Nahrawan. These are incredible and important battles of Amir al Mu'mineen in which the Imam provided us with invaluable lessons. Lessons in the ethics of war. Lessons in how to be forgiving when you are able to take revenge. Lessons in Amir al Mu'mineen manifesting Islam in its pristine form. After the Battle of Jamal, you know that Talha and Zubair were killed. The Imam forgave the one who was responsible, the symbol of the battle. He forgave her and sent her back home with honor and dignity. Then he captured Abdullah ibn Zubayr. Abdullah, the son of Zubayr, was a very foul mouthed animal. He was always cursing Amir al Mu'mineen and saying the most disgusting and most vulgar things, not just in the life of Amir al Mu'mineen, but also after. He was a person who refrained, imagine how hateful he was. When he came to power in Medina, he would refrain from mentioning Rasulullah in his sermons. Imagine Rasulullah, not his family. So they said to him, why don't you mention the Prophet's name? He said, because he has a family who will feel proud if I mention their grandfather, meaning the Ahlul Bayt. He tried to kill them, he tried to burn them, he was a vulgar man. And so, during the battle, he continued with this approach, Amir al-Mu'mineen captured him. They took him as a prisoner, brought him to Amir al-Mu'mineen, فَصَفَعَ صَفَحَ عَنْ The Imam forgave. He let him go. Again, knowing what a vulgar person this is, 
The Imam let him go. Then the Imam forgave all of the people of Basra. Remember the people of Basra were the ones who backed the army of the camel. They were the ones who provided the manpower, the weapons, the money. They took the money from the Muslim treasury in Basra and they used it to fight Amir al muminin They killed, as Shaykh al-Mufid mentions when he speaks about in his book on Jamal, beautiful and invaluable resource by the way, Al-Jamal by Shaykh al-Mufid. He says that the number of deaths in the Battle of Jamal, which lasted less than a day, was 30,000 souls. 25,000 on the side of the camel and 5,000 on the side. In other words, 5,000 of Amir al muminins loyal companions were killed. And yet Amir al muminin forgave all of them. And the way it happened was this. They came to Amir al muminin The Imam said, what do you think I should do now? They said to him, we ask you to be like Al-Abdus Salih, meaning who? Prophet Yusuf, who when he confronted his brothers, he said to them, لا تثريب عليكم اليوم. There's nothing for you to worry about. He forgave his brothers. So the Imam said, I will forgive all of them. The entire city of Basra. He forgave all of them. Now, since I mentioned this, I want to mention At-Tabarsi, who is the author of the famous exegesis of the Qur'an, tafsir of the Qur'an, known as Al-Majma'ul Bayan. Majma'ul Bayan by At-Tabarsi is also a great tafsir. I believe it's also been translated into English. When it comes to this verse in Surah Yusuf, where Yusuf says to his brothers, قَالَ لَا تَثْرِيبَ عَلَيْكُمُ الْيَوْمِ يَغْفِرُ اللَّهُ لَكُمْ وَهُوَ أَرْحَمُ الرَّاحِمِينَ there is nothing that burdens you today. Allah will forgive you and He is the most merciful. He mentions this story. He says that Yusuf was sitting after they were introduced and they knew who he was. They were sitting and eating a meal. His brothers said to him, you've been so generous to us. You've been so good to us. We ask you to separate your food from our food. You can go and eat and dine with the officials and whatnot, and just leave us here to eat by ourselves. He said, why? They said, because we're too ashamed to look you in the eye, having done what we've done to you. Look at how Yusuf responds to them. Yusuf said to them, what are you talking about? Before you came, notice how not only is he saying, no, it's okay, I forgive you. He makes it look as though they are the ones doing him a favor. He says, before you came, people thought I was just a slave who happened to go to prison and go through this journey. And then I became king. But now they know that I am from the lineage of Ibrahim al-Khalil. Now because of you, people recognize me for who I truly am. I am the son of Yaqub. This is Safa. This is forgiveness. Imagine brothers, honestly, what the brothers of Yusuf did to him, no brother does to his brother. Other than trying to kill him, other than throwing him out in the desert to die in the well, right? Other than all of these things, they caused him to go to prison for how long? Do you know how long? At Tabarsi mentions it. He said 18 years he went to prison. The Quran speaks about a portion of that. After he said to those two inmates who came to him and they asked him for, uh, for their dreams to be interpreted, right? And he said to one of them that you're going to be released and you'll survive and said to the other that you'll be executed. Then the one who's about to be released, Yusuf said to him, When you go to the king and you meet him, tell him that you've got someone like me who's in prison. He's forgotten all about me. Maybe you could put in a good word for me. Allah sent Jibra'il down. I don't want to talk about this particular incident, but Jibra'il came immediately. And he said to him, Ya Yusuf, instead of appealing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you appeal to the king? When did we abandon you? When did we desert you? Allah has protected you all along and now you ask this inmate to go and put in a good word for you? فَلَبِثَ As a punishment for this, Punishment meaning discipline. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants his prophets to be the best of the best. Not because he committed a sin, it's not a sin. 
But as a result of this, Allah says, فَلَبِثَ فِي السِّجْنِ بِالْعَسِنِينَ So he stayed for a few more years in prison. Those few more years were eight years. He'd already been in prison for 10 years. So a total of 18 years. Brothers and sisters, if my brother didn't put me behind bars for 18 years, or even eight years, or even a year and eight months. No, if he was the reason for me to be dragged to the police station, you will see how angry I get. You will see how all relations will be severed. And yet Yusuf says, لا تثريب عليكم اليوم يغفر الله لكم إنه وهو أرحم الراحمين we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless us, to illuminate our hearts so that we could follow in the footsteps of our masters and our leaders. The reason Amir al muminin is called Imam is because he is in front of us, who leads us. We're supposed to walk behind him in his footsteps. If we can't have the same patience and forgiveness and forbearance, as Ali ibn Abi Talib, then at least a portion of it. At least let's try to walk in the same lane as opposed to the opposing lane. At least let's try and do something in honor of Ali ibn Abi Talib so that on the day of judgment, when we meet him, I could say, Ya Amir al muminin I did this for you. I did that for you. I forgave this person for your sake. And the Imam could then take my hand and say, You are a true follower. You are a devotee or someone who actually tried to walk in my footsteps. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Let us end with Dua Al-Faraj. I don't know if we have time for a Q&A. Uh, as I was told uh, was planned. If we do, we'll take a few questions. Otherwise, we will call it a night. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. اللهم كل وليك الحجة ابن الحسن صلواتك عليه وعلى آبائه في هذه الساعة وفي كل ساعة وليا وحافظا وقائدا وناصرا ودليلا وعينا حتى تسكنه أرضك طوعا وتمتعه فيها طويلا برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين وصل اللهم على سيدنا ونبينا محمد وآله